So we, the presentation that we will share is uh, very much actually the same presentation that we shared with you by email, but we thought maybe we could put some words uh, along with it uh, and uh, share our thoughts uh, on what's written behind. Uh, we're a very nascent uh, uh, club in Turkey. As you know, thematic clubs are new and we're the first uh, thematic club uh, formed in Turkey uh, focusing on ecology. We decided to become an e-club uh, because of the circumstances during which uh, we were formed. But we also thought that being an e-club allows us to gain members from across the country. Uh, we're not a very small country. We're about the size of France uh, to compare. And we have members, most of us are actually, all of us here are residing in Istanbul, but we have members living in other parts of Turkey as well. And we thought if we wanted to meet in person, we can always do that. E-Club doesn't prohibit us from meeting in person. We were founded in January 2021, but we started discussions in uh, September uh, by, uh, and uh, we came together through the initiation of an existing Rotarian uh, who basically knew most of us. And we invited other friends to form the initial number that was required. Uh, we say among ourselves uh, that had it not been for this theme of ecology, probably most of us would never have become Rotarian, uh, uh, except for our president, uh, uh, who was a Rotarian when he lived in the US. None of us have been Rotarians before. So this is our first experience. And um, we're learning most of the ways as we go along. Uh, as we understand, we're the 13th club focused on ecology in the world. And we also understand that there are about 20 of us across the globe. We're trying to reach out to uh, the other clubs as well uh, because we share uh, the same concerns and the same ambitions and the same hopes uh, to do better for this planet. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot to learn from each other. So that's why we're here. We went through a formation process uh, and uh, during that process, we wanted to define certain things uh, and to make sure that we were all on the same page. We wanted to uh, define what our mission is and we decided uh, we, we had a uh, participatory process and we decided that our mission is to implement solutions to the global ecological crisis and improve the welfare of all living beings through projects and collaborations that raise awareness and protect natural resources. All of our members participated in every single word of this. And so this brings us together. And we value respect for the environment and all living beings. We value nonviolent communication, our differences, collaboration and partnerships, supportive and friendly relationships, and democratic governance. Uh, on democratic governance, we uh, uh, are learning the rotary terminology. Uh, but we have, for example, instead of committees, we have teams. Instead of committee chairs, we have team captains. Uh, uh, so it's very, it's, it's slightly different, but uh, we're trying to mimic the Rotarian uh, structure in, a, in our own way, if you will. We aim to develop and execute and contribute to projects that aim to, uh, maybe I should not read all the text, but basically uh, I'm sure you are all aware of these two. Uh, my uh, colleague uh, Inji will explain, but we, did, we uh, decided on two priority areas, one global and one uh, uh, the national. I'll say the global one. The global one is uh, to uh, reduce uh, uh, greenhouse emissions, because that is something that we cannot constrain to a country. It's everywhere. And within uh, Turkey, we decided to focus on the issue of water conservation. Uh, and Inji will tell more about that in just a second. Um, oops, sorry, my screen is not moving. Uh, and we want to, while we're doing our projects, we also want to focus on creating awareness about the ecological responsibilities and necessary actions with individuals, organizations, and actions about broader acceptance and implementation of our projects, thereby contributing to the local and global effort to mitigate ecological crises. Uh, through selective projects. Uh, and we will tell you a little bit about each one of these projects. Maybe uh, I can quickly uh, tell you a little bit about how we choose our projects. We uh, went through a process again as the whole club to decide how do we decide which projects to move forward with? What are our priorities? 
but what are the projects that we're going to do? Because we all are very passionate about this. We all have different ideas, but we need to focus. So we came up, uh, we have a team called uh, Project uh, Development Support and uh, 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 Contribution Team, if you will. And that team, uh, we have every member can propose a project. And uh, we, dis we came up with some principles as the whole club of what we don't want and what we desire. And, uh, and a six step process on how we're going to develop these projects. Uh, and at various stages, the project comes for approval to the entire club. Uh, we basically uh, start with uh, a concept note, uh, and then we move on to a, a pre-pilot phase where we even have a budget that is 50%, uh, uh, maybe uh, an estimate, uh, it can be valuable by 50%. And then we develop a feasibility study, we pilot it, and if it works well, then we scale it. The main reason why, uh, one of the things that we uh, thought when we were developing this, pro this process is that we wanted to uh, focus our attention, time, uh, financial resources, everything we have on projects that would be sustainable and that would be lasting. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we would fill in a gap that is not being filled. We wanted to make sure, we wanted to see how we can leverage the unique talents and, uh, and uh, capabilities of our team members. Uh, and we didn't want to do uh, just any project that uh, other clubs can do or anyone out there can do. We wanted to identify the right gaps that fit our uh, contribution and, and build lasting projects. So these are some of the leading projects that we are involved with, but uh, I will now turn it over to my colleagues uh, uh, maybe uh, we can start with the organic waste chain. Uh, this should take about one or two minutes per project, if that's okay, Kim. Uh, yes, that is perfect. And let me know who else I should spotlight at this time. So maybe if we're going to go by this order, it's uh, our president, Oljai. Yeah. Okay. If you start okay, this is uh, I can spotlight. Uh, are you uh, okay? Am I? Uh, am I? Uh, oh, I have to stop the screen sharing. Yet or okay? Yeah, almost. Just one moment. I'll find okay. you in the uh, lineup here. If you yeah, keep speaking. I can yeah. So this is the um, the idea here is to attack the entire uh, f uh, wasted food chain, uh, which starts at uh, the moment we buy food to the moment uh, we dispose the food. And uh, we are trying to see if we can attack uh, all sorts of different aspects of it uh, from uh, public awareness of, of uh, not to buy unnecessarily, uh, but if they're gonna buy, um, uh, not to waste it. And if uh, they're gonna have to put it in trash, then separate it. And, uh, and then once it's separated, we, uh, we run into the bigger problem, which uh, may or may not be a problem in your area, but uh, the, the collection and uh, uh, using organic uh, materials to make compost or uh, animal feed. And we're trying to do this in a way uh, that would uh, make economical sense as well and uh, hopefully have some economical value in the end that can be uh, spread uh, throughout the entire chain uh, so that uh, everybody can benefit from this, uh, the, the, this whole uh, process. Let me stop here because uh, there are like six of these and we can go on and on about this. Uh, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer later. Thank you. Okay, then next in line is I think Barrett with uh, Musilage. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you about the Musilage, uh, the sea snot problem in Marmara Sea um, in Turkey. And I'll be sharing, I just found a ah. nice article. Ah. Okay, I just. <laughs> I just shared the picture of mucilage because it's something that... <laughs> yeah, it wasn't me. It was the mucilage. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a slimy uh, mucus um, 
looking like material um, secreted by um, microorganisms in the sea. Uh, uh, it looks like this. So it happened. Uh, it was an extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, it just happened last April. Um, looked like this, um, as you see in the picture. Um, it, it's a big scale phenomenon. And um, so normally these microorganisms are, are responsible of generate oxygen. These are algae, uh, algaes, um, phytoplanktons. Um, when they're too much stressed, when um, uh, there's a lot of pollution uh, in the sea and the temperature is um, um, high enough and the weather um, um, doesn't, if, if there's no winds um, or no currents in the sea, everything is um, calm, let's say, um, uh, with the pollution uh, that was happening, that's been happening for many, many years. Uh, these phytoplanktons, they, they create this um, slimy looking material. Um, later on, it affects um, uh, uh, the sea transportation, the boats, the big ships, um, obviously the whole ecosystem, the fish, the corals, it starts um, going down in the sea column and um, covering the whole reef uh, corals are affected, fish are affected, uh, people are scared of eating fish. Um, so there are lots of unknowns. Um, this is happening because uh, the Marmara Sea is being included uh, by uh, the municipalities and uncontrolled um, uh, um, pollution as well uh, for the last 20, 30 years. And um, so we're organizing um, a workshop to gather um, all the stakeholders, uh, ministries, municipalities, NGOs to talk about this and find solutions and um, create collaborations um, uh, on how to um, um, take over our, our seas and uh, not pollute it again and uh, not seeing this um, mucilage problem again. Wow, thank you. But it, I was, very visual. I was, yeah. But I was going to say maybe uh, to make it more uh, concrete, we can say a little bit about what Marmara Sea is, where it is, and what it looks like, and uh, geographic. Sure. I'm trying to find um, a picture to share. But uh, if if you could actually, um, John, uh, yeah, you can. Can I share my screen? Yes. I wasn't sure. Oh, yes, you can. Sorry we, about that. we could see it. <laughs> I I wasn't sure. Okay. Temporarily. Um, yeah, you go ahead. Okay. 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 Um, I'll do it right away. So this is the link I sent you. Um, this is how it looks like, uh, exactly where um, it is accumulated. Um, so it's, it's a, it becomes a thick layer on top of the water. Um, these are, as you see, uh, in marina with the boats. Um, so Marmara Sea is the almost enclosed uh, water body um, next to Istanbul and many other industrial, industrialized cities uh, in the Marmara region of Turkey. Um, so this, this is the area um, mostly that happened and started moving towards uh, Aegean Sea, uh, you know, the sea between um, Greece and Turkey um, through the Bosphorus of um, uh, Dardanelles or Çanakkale. Um, and uh, yeah, um, now visually we don't see it much, but it, starts, it started accumulating um, uh, on top of the... Um, uh, sea basin. Sea, yeah, exactly. Seabed, I would say. Um, but the problem is there. It's just not visual. And uh, that's, that's the worst part of it. Because as human beings, when we see um, the problem, when we see it visually, we think that it's, it's gone away. Um, but it's, it's there. And we still want to address that problem with all the stakeholders. And uh, this you. is the global view. But since right. we're with um, you, we can uh, stay with you and you can talk oh, about a more visual problem that we're trying to tackle. Elimination of plastic bag use oh. by pharmacies. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sure. Um, so yes, there is, uh, there is a level of um, um, consciousness about plastic bags. Uh, we probably or, should uh, stop uh, screen oh, share. Sure. Screen share. I will do it right away. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's there's a there's a consciousness about uh, 
the use of plastic bags or not using plastic bags because um, it becomes microplastic, nanoplastics, and uh, you start seeing them in, in fish, in um, sea, um, uh, marine um, uh, uh, animals, I would say, uh, that, that goes into our food chain. Um, as today is the uh, World Food Day, uh, I think it becomes an import, important subject too. Um, so there's a law. Uh, there's a law now in Turkey uh, um, that says if you go to a market, supermarket, um, like in Canada probably and in, in the U.S., you have to pay to get a plastic bag. Um, so it started uh, very strong. Um, everybody was obeying this rule, this law. Uh, but we think it's not going anywhere. It, it, it didn't go anywhere. It, it's just um, being applied in uh, large supermarkets. Um, and especially in the pharmacies, when you, so we use a lot, we use, so we don't sell um, uh, drugs in, or medication in, in the supermarkets over here. There are lots of pharmacies everywhere. And just, just even to get a small box of medication, um, pharmacies they tend to give you a li very little uh, plastic bag uh, people tend to have this behavior uh, of not showing or not wanting to show what they're buying from the pharmacies and you know for every single size of medication box uh, syrup or whatever uh, they tend to give um, um, a plastic bag and you cannot even use that plastic bag later on as a liner or something so um, because pharmacies are um, locations, institutions where you can kind of teach people how to behave um, and how to protect health and uh, probably environment. Uh, we wanted to start with uh, pharmacies to um, create design campaigns on reducing plastic bags or maybe using um, other types of bags, cotton bags. But our, um, our focus is on not using anything if possible um, and bring your own bag um, just to carry stuff. So we're, we're conducting a survey to understand the uh, behavioral processes on, um, um, you know, um, uh, of the people um, in Turkey, in Istanbul. And with that information after the survey, uh, with the data that we uh, collect and after that process, uh, we're gonna start designing our campaign. Um, on how to reduce it. Okay. Sorry if I, it was too no, long. No, that was great. Thank <laughs> that you. That was fabulous. It. Thank you. Kim, is it okay if I move along down the list? The list is in front of me. I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not. Yes, it's very good. And I'm thinking if we can have maybe 15, 20 minutes to uh, also share our stories afterwards, that would be wonderful. Of course. I, I don't think we'll take more than five more minutes. Uh, we have just, so we'll do one minute each for. Uh, for uh, three more so, so. Sounds good. Okay, I apologize. Um, next one is a uh, ecological transformation. Uh, uh, let me quickly say, explain this. Uh, we we also live in a very old country, and we have a lot of uh, villages with a lot of historical background, and we have a lot of migration from Turkey uh, within Turkey and from Turkey, from villages to cities, and from Turkey to European countries. There are a lot of vacant villages, and we're trying to revive the. Uh, economic life of these villages by turning them into by or uh, reshaping them into ecological villages by uh, restoring their uh, uh, heritage, their uh, old buildings, etc. Uh, and here we're using the unique advantage of our club because we have amazing architects uh, who are uh, experts in ecological buildings. Uh, so that's what we're trying to leverage here. And we've identified a couple of candidates in Turkey, candidate villages. We're trying to talk to the local communities to see if it would have a buy-in from the local communities. And we'll, we'll choose one and we'll move forward with that. This will be a long-term project, obviously. Very quickly, uh, next one is uh, Oljay Abi uh, is the, uh, the uh, Parma Grant Project. Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, I'm muting it because my dog, my dog can bark at it all. Um, so this project is about uh, changing gift giving habits and channeling the gift giving habits uh, towards uh, some usefulness in the ecology uh, uh, world. 
so we're starting with the Rotarians. Uh, we have about 2,000 Rotarians in our uh, region, uh, 2420. And uh, uh, there will be a gift uh, set up. They can, uh, instead of uh, you know, uh, buying another uh, useless thing that will sit uh, in people's uh, drawers, uh, we, we try to uh, channel that towards uh, a gift that would then educate um, elementary school and high school uh, educators in permaculture. Uh, so, so basically uh, 10 or 12 people, once they're uh, gathered uh, from the schools, uh, they will be gifted uh, and they will go and take a class uh, which is about like a total of eight hours uh, in online. And then they will go on and uh, implement some of those ideas like composting or starting to, to work with the soil or recycling, whatever. When you say permaculture, you, you have uh, these different ideas, obviously. So that's the idea. I'll stop here. Okay, thank you. Then I'll pass it on to Inji. Uh, about the water strategy. We don't have any concrete projects uh, related to uh, water, but Inja, maybe you can tell us about the process we're going through. Yeah, hi. Uh, you know, we are facing gas war drought problem in Turkey, and that's why uh, we want to we want to keep our focus on uh, saving more water. And uh, we started by making a deep research about this topic, and we uh, learned that 75% of Water consumption in Turkey is coming from uh, agricultural irrigation. Um, yeah, irrigation. So uh, that's why we wanted to narrow down our topic topic in this field, and we are making more research on it. And um, we are planning to use technological tools uh, in agriculture, um, and still working on it. And we will be happy if we could hear. Uh, your experiences on it as well. Thank you, Inji. One last uh, thing to share with me for one minute. We have been invited to, uh, one might call it a challenge, but we see it as an opportunity to uh, work with our district. Uh, we were invited by our governor to see if we can make our regional assembly, the district assembly, uh, carbon neutral, uh, net zero carbon emission, which is a huge challenge in Turkey because the custom in Turkey is that most of these Rotarians live in Istanbul, but they fly to Southern Turkey for a few days, stay at a fancy hotel um, mm. and to have their event. So we said, look, first we need to make sure that it happens near you. We shouldn't fly over, but we, we love this challenge. Uh, so we have a team working on uh, this issue, learning examples from other parts of the world, uh, how we can uh, reduce the emissions of this existing event and hopefully convince Rotarians to become more environmentally friendly and eventually, uh, have these events uh, in Istanbul or, or you know, wherever, you know, uh, they can host it, but they don't have to fly. Uh, so those are what we're working on. So back to you, Kim. Thank you all very much. As I posted in the chat, this is so encouraging to hear. And we are inspired and informed. And yeah, we, we can see already, I believe, a lot of similarities and ways we can help each other. And so if you'll permit me, I will share my screen and tell a few stories about what our club has begun even in our short time since our charter in June, June 15th was our charter date. Let's give that a moment to catch up. So as I mentioned, we are a lakeside community and one would even call us a village. But we are the newest Rotary Club in our district. The uh, motivation for forming was of course, based on our environmental challenges here in our region. And it was felt that a Rotary Club specific to Shawnigan Lake would be the most helpful and specifically focused on the environment and to be an outdoors hands-on project club. Our members bring a variety of talents and experience to the club. 
So what they all have in common is that I've had personally had conversations with each of them as we were forming the club. And that became the way of introducing people to Rotary is to go for walks and talks. And you can see that a lot of the talents we have in common include gardening and marketing and being community leaders in our own right. So we have some bakers, teachers, engineers, technologists. Uh, we have a teaching horticulturalist at the local private school who runs a greenhouse school program. And we have other talents here, including uh, people who work with food. So uh, chefs and ways of thinking about our diets is very much a part of our conversation. And together, we hope to learn what it means to be a cause-based club and to serve our community and to serve to change lives. Here's some text that we prepared for a recent uh, presentation we did this week to our local government, to the CVRD. It's called the Cowichan Valley Regional District. So our village is not incorporated yet. We're part of a larger zone and we have to share government resources and government time and attention. And so we're hoping to create some positive beneficial collaboration. So I'll read this slowly. We are Canada's first Rotary Eco Club. We are part of a growing network of Eco Clubs worldwide and we believe we're number 23, by the way. Uh, we're based outdoors. We actually have no fixed address. We meet in our village in person. And we are devoted to environmental stewardship and sustainability practices. We believe in honoring our First Nations and other community stakeholders. We are actively networking to build collaborative relationships, sharing knowledge, and developing strategic implementation of our community assessment. It's called Think Seanigan. And it was published in January, 2020, just before the pandemic. And so there really are no other community groups that have stepped in to implement Think Sean again, other than the local um, CVRD municipal parks and trails program. So we are very excited to uh, explain in our presentation today that we had a positive meeting with them this week and that our next steps forward involve uh, those government collaborations. I'd like to share a few social media posts. We did some gardening and planting around parking areas this summer, even as we were learning to charter and who would be interested in this kind of work. So we planted trees, we planted for pollinators, and we accepted donations of native plants or plants that would thrive even under um, drought conditions, but we, learned a lot along the way because this summer was very challenging for all of the gardeners. We had a heat dome event that killed off a lot of uh, shoreline animals. So we're talking ocean uh, native animals and plants as well as the gardens were devastated. We had berries that were dried on the vine. Um, it, was, it was really difficult. And of course, the, there was a loss of life as well for, for people because of the extreme heat event. Our First Nations are also part of that collaboration. So I'm sharing two pictures now where we're um, actively involved in connecting and supporting reconciliation events because our country has a sad history of how we treated the First Peoples. And lastly, we are hoping to collaborate more and more with schools and school gardening programs. So the last picture shows how we did a uh, summer garden stewardship and cleanup of our local high school. And that was a lot of fun to get in there and uh, make it presentable before the kids came back to school in the fall. Now, I'd like to also share some of the challenges that we have. I pulled this graphic from our local environmental stewardship group who's been here for about 20 years now. They are called the Seanigan Basin Society. And our lake has some challenges with recreational use as well as invasive plant management. We have uh, algae, but we especially have a milfoil problem. So the boats always need to be cared for properly so that they don't um, disturb the vegetation and lead to choking the lake water. And not shown on this slide is also, I won't get into a lot of detail, but 
we have a situation where there was a number of contaminated soil loads, like hundreds of truckloads that were dumped into our watershed up above the lake. And you would think, well, how could this even happen in a society that is aware of their environmental responsibilities? And yet there were uh, obviously financial temptations and other situations where legal loopholes were used to uh, per get per per provincial permits to drop that soil. And so now we're dealing with a mess and we have a lot of passion in our community about what can we do even though it seems we feel helpless it was great to be able to come together and you see students forming these words at the local private school Shawnigan Lake School and we had a number of celebrities and other messages to just say please we need to protect our drinking water we need to protect our lake and so that is an ongoing issue here's a map just to give you an idea of population. So I like this map because it shows that the residents are clustered along the lake shore. So there's all of the issues with protecting the health of the lake shore and riparian areas, as you know, from our work with ESRAG, the uh, Rotary Group with Environmental Sustainability. But also you see vast tracts of land that have no private ownership. They're actually uh, forest lots. And so we're dealing with overforestry and we're dealing with, um, sorry, this shows our cleanup. So I'll carry on with the next, um, the next uh, picture. So you can see the mixed use of our area, but we also need to coexist with the wildlife and their habitats are being disturbed. So I, I don't know if you can really see on uh, your device, but in this aerial view of the lake, there's patches where clear cutting has happened. And so that has really disturbed the um, biodiversity of our area and it's a concern. These pictures show just the patchwork nature of the interrelationships between the watersheds and the health of the environment and the biodiversity that's been disrupted. And if you were to go on Google and see a time lapse of our region, it's really devastating to see what's happened here. And yet we continually come up against the old school forestry uh, practices and then the new ecoforestry uh, sustainable practices. And so we hope to be advocates and, and participate in those conversations and that behavior change. As I mentioned earlier, we are very much gifted with a complete community assessment. It was pretty much available to any local citizen going onto our government websites. And we can read all about the recommendations to our area and how to, as you say, revitalize the gathering spaces and our village spaces and have that also be a, a model and a showcase for what can be done in terms of being beneficial to all. So we have issues with pedestrian safety and um, corridors, even viewpoints to the lake, believe it or not, people arrive to our village and wonder where the lake is because it just hasn't been well thought out over the years how to create public access points. So as Rotary, we do believe that we can bring all of our local groups, including government and other stakeholders together, we see a world and emphasis on learning to see that world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and in ourselves. Here's a view from one of our local summer camps. Uh, Camp Pringle is uh, just an example as well as the Easter Seal Camp for children and families that are uh, dealing with disabilities or other challenges like cancer treatments to come and experience nature to be immersed in a very healing and restorative way to be able to enjoy adaptive recreation opportunities. Those are the kinds of things we hope to foster as well. And we're very proud of the leadership talent that we've collected so far in our club so that we can have these conversations. One of the camp directors is a Rotary alumni. She was a uh, Rotary Youth Exchange to uh, Europe. 
And she is now the camp director and is able to return to Rotary because of our club model. Our next steps for village re revitalization and creating uh, more habitats and native plant restoration involve an adopt a planter program, we call it. And so this summer we were supporting uh, these two ladies who last year personally paid for their planting efforts and now are being uh, brought into the eco club format so that we were grateful recipients of a government grant to continue this work and to create even more uh, planters and community garden spaces. So here's an example of what went well this year. We created uh, places for pollinators as well as uh, seed flowers for birds and other wildlife to enjoy. Where formerly, especially in the picture on the right, it was just a loading dock at one of our local stores but an iconic mm -hmm. store. So we are ambassadors of outdoor education and recreation, champions for preservation of land for parks and trails, influencers for leave no trace use of parks and trails, cultivators of community gardens and beautification efforts, Sponsors of innovative gathering spaces, which we hope to uh, especially work on next summer. Supporters of environmental initiatives, including some of the things we talked about, the packaging. Facilitators of zero waste events and cleanups. Uh, this group was also born out of three years of annual community cleanups. And as you know, we are mostly an online presence. So we've created a website, which we hope to populate with even more eco resources, including recommended reading and links. And we are so excited that this week, we were able to secure a working partnership with Parks and Trails. And this is our village center, which has our community center and a number of opportunities to plant and connect with our local museum. So our store keepers, factor hugely and one of our eco club members is the curator of the museum and the Shanigan Lake Historical Society and Museum is just a treasure that we want to amplify their messaging and hopefully have indoor meeting space when they ex their expansion um, takes shape over the next two years. We are rotary people of action and we are so, so honored, privileged, and delighted that you reached out to us. So let's travel our journey together. Do we think we're too small to change the world to make a difference? Not at all. Joining together across the world, we can make changes. So thank you very much for allowing us to present to you today. Well, thank you, Kim. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions. Can I ask? Questions? Yes, this is Q&A time. Absolutely. All right. So uh, is Shanigan uh, close to Victoria? Uh, do, do you guys commute to Victoria for work or how does it work? Uh, yes, all of the above. You guessed correctly. And I'll even invite, as I answer this question, I'll invite our club president and treasurer to step in as well as um, our other club member on the call, Jenny, because we all have experience with this lifestyle. And yes, the commute is about an hour's drive. It's very scenic, but also very um, challenging. It's a mountainous drive. There are wildlife encounters. We have uh, had vehicle tragedies with uh, deer strikes, bear strikes, cougar strikes even, um, as well as uh, rainy conditions and uh, many times the road is closed as well. So that cuts us off from our main capital city of Victoria to the south. Would anyone else so like I to presume, comment? Yeah, so I, I also presume that there, there's a, a rotary or at least one rotary club at Victoria. Oh yes, we have a thriving district. It's Rotary 5020 and I'll type that into the chat so uh, you can look them up. We also have them linked to our, our club page. And they are clubs, I would say, oh, I think there's 53 clubs in our district and very uh, 
quite a few, sometimes multiple clubs per community up and down our island. And uh, our closest club is called the South Couching Club. And they were actually serving a cluster of three communities, including ours, for the last 20 years. And they were planted by the Rotary Club of Duncan, who was chartered in 1931. And they were also our sponsor club because I was a member of that club as their, uh, as their publicity chair. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add that, well, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was wonderful. But um, as Kim mentioned, our club, it's really new. But like you, um, nobody else was Rotary members before, uh, except for Kim. So it's kind of a new uh, format for all of us as well. And I think the, the eco part of it was definitely the driving uh, factor. So I, I just had a question. I was curious um, when you were talking about the changing of gift giving, were you referring to um, a lot of the, uh, for lack of a better word, paraphernalia that comes with Rotary or were you talking about just gift giving in general? Oh God, you, uh, <laughs> you really <laughs> hit it on the nail. Great question. <laughs> on the head. Um, we, uh, we are not accepting the paraphernalia that uh, the region uh, is uh, distributing to other clubs. We're just saying no to all of that. But no, this is basically uh, just people, uh, regular people. So it's not club level, but it's district level, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, you instead of buying uh, somebody another sweater that uh, he or she will keep it in the drawer for the next uh, 13 years you just you know basically do something more useful with it uh, so that's the idea but uh, you you are exactly right we don't want printed material from the district we don't want those flags we don't uh, and unfortunately uh, I don't know about Canada but I uh, was a Rotarian in San Francisco and uh, we didn't have too many uh, of these ceremonial things, uh, these rituals in, in our club in San Francisco. San Francisco uh, was the second ever club. Uh, you may know this already. Uh, the first one being Chicago and the, the second one being San Francisco. So by the time I joined in, in um, early 2000s, um, they were really over these kind of um, uh, rituals. So when I came here uh, to Turkey, uh, I found that they were really into rituals and, uh, you know, wearing scarves and ties and every uh, a new governor, uh, you know, prints a new a designed tie and a scarf and things like that, which is, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, we have to change that. Yes. It's a tricky thing, though, because like you say, it's so entrenched, entrenched in the the rotary way that it's uh yeah it's, i think it's is that is that so in in canada as well yes well in my oh, experience it, again we're new but i from what what we've seen so far yes yeah so i mean in san francisco it wasn't so i was really surprised when i first came here and then the other question i had was um how do you do your fundraising for for such big projects uh john you're, you're muted you're muted i'm sorry uh, we have a separate team that is dedicated to building partners building uh, relationships with potential stakeholders uh, we haven't come to that stage where we need to actually really fundraise for any of these projects because we're really progressing slowly along our steps to make sure that this is really ready to go for funding. This is ready to go for implementation. Um, but there are, you know, we're not concerned about finding funding uh, in the team when we talk about this, these projects because uh, there are a lot of resources we have. We have access to EU resources. We have access to United Nations resources. There are foundations in Turkey. Uh, this, for example, project, the gifting project, is actually, we built it in such a way that it self-sustains. 
it doesn't require much funding. It requires a little bit of advertisement. Uh, but if we do it first at the Rotary level, it's very easy to advertise among the 2000 Rotarians we have in, in our district. And if it works, then it's easy to scale. It will bring some noise around itself as well. So it's self-sustaining. On the, uh, for, for example, organic waste one, uh, that will require some funding, uh, but there is a lot of money out there uh, for this. As a new, uh, we have to be a legal entity in Turkey. Actually, I was going to ask you, you said uh, you're, you have this open air office uh, or not even an office. We have this tiny little office because we have to have an address, um, but we have to be a legal NGO under Turkish law. Uh, uh, our NGO is obviously very young, so we're not eligible ourselves to get funding from these big uh, organizations. Uh, but we partner with organizations who can bring other skills and other connections and have the uh, track record to be able to justify app applying for those funding opportunities. But we hope that in a few years time, we'll be able to do this on our own. We just actually had a training today uh, on uh, global grants of Rotary. We haven't really looked into it in detail, but at some point, uh, you know, we'd love to leverage the resources of Rotary as well. I can completely agree with that. It's something I have yet to take the grant writing seminar, uh, but we do have a Rotary Club in our district that's dedicated to just that, to bringing representatives from other clubs together so that they can uh, learn best practices for grant applications. And they're called the Mid-Island Rotary Group. So they are more of a e-club, if you will, because like I said, they are members from all of the clubs. And so we will be sending a representative to join the Mid-Island Group as well. I can speak to the funding uh, question as well, because we, recently reached out to one of our large grocery store chains and they have community funds available. So these things require a written re uh, request online and then we just get in line with all of the other groups and wait our turn to hear back from them. But interestingly enough, we didn't request money or food, we requested plants plant material and we're not fussy. Uh, we'll take plants that have expired, if you will. So for example, blooming plants that will return year after year because their bulbs are a particular favorite. And we were able to rescue plants that normally they would dispose of. So this is a, a, a project we hope to continue and, and grow awareness about and uh, be a showcase for. If I may add uh, something here, um, we haven't said explicitly that we're going to uh, fundraise uh, per project, but I think uh, implicitly we have that approach, meaning that every project will, uh, once it's well defined uh, and, and the, the funds for it is uh, clear, the budget is clear. Uh, then we will go after funding, uh, no matter how big or how small. Uh, one of the things that we try to do is to attack problems that are um, not easy. And, it, you know, a lot of things are not easy about ecology anyway. A lot of uh, problems are deep-seated so uh, and, and complicated and, and takes uh, probably a lot of time and, and effort uh, but as John said at some point, uh, we're not daunted by that. We're not uh, discouraged by that. We want to solve the problems that other Rotary clubs uh, are not going to be able to solve. I mean, to another Rotary club, uh, ecology is one of the seven items. For us, it's the item. And uh, that's what we're going to focus on. And, and that's how we're going to work. So the, to, come, to come back, we're not going to do these uh, like bake sales and, and these kind of things to raise funds because those are, in, our, in my opinion anyway, uh, they're, they take a lot of time and effort and they, don't, they produce a lot of good camaraderie, but not a lot of money in my opinion. Does that answer the question? 
I think this is really helpful too. And uh, as you probably guessed, we are trying to be innovative and show other Rotary Clubs that there are different ways of doing things. Yeah, that totally answered my question. I was, it, I was just curious because your project sounded so large, um, but yes, that totally answers the question. I was gonna add too here in regards to your plastic bag um, initiative, uh, for here, it seems to be happening like city by city. So where we live, they have banned the use of plastic bags in grocery stores. And it took a little bit of time for people to adjust, but uh, not as long as you would think. And now it's just normal. Everybody has the habit of bringing their own bags with them. Um, there are paper bags you can get if you forget yours. But um, it didn't take as long as you would think. It, but it took the city to actually... Um, ban it themselves and I don't it's not Canada wide I don't think but it is where we are it, it cer certainly requires um, uh, dedication I think from from city level um, for the government the local government or the city um, yes it is uh, there's a law right now that says uh, it has to be charged to people who ask for plastic bags um, but I don't think the city or the municipality over here um, oversees um, um, that process. So um, there are lots of stores they they don't they don't follow this because they they're afraid of losing the customers. Uh, the customers would get angry at them at them uh, because they're not giving them those plastic bags, um, kind of thing. So it um, it's also a cultural thing. I I think. Um, there's there's also um, an important um, in, important part of uh, culture being involved in in that behavioral process. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's good to hear. Uh, it's it's really <laughs> uh, inspiring to hear that it is banned over there and uh, people are um, getting accustomed. Um, and I was uh, I was going to ask uh, uh, Kim and others, what is the greatest uh, environmental or ecological problem right now in that area that you're facing. Do you um, do you have a priority um, in uh, certain topics, and um, do you prioritize some type of projects? Um, because you know we, we have in 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 the clubs we have limited amount of people, limited amount of time and resources and money, so. How do you, how are you planning to um, organize this, let's say? Oh, well, it's- Maybe, Kim, this, can I just step in yes, here quickly? Yes, please, Steve, um, that would be for, helpful. Sorry, guys. Um, our our club president, Steve. I apologize, I have to leave for martial arts practice, which starts here in half an hour. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you very much, everyone in Istanbul for reaching out and contacting us. Um, I was really impressed with your presentation as well. I was, was really impressed with the presentation that our seemingly semi-professional secretary has put together for you guys. Um, you can tell it was very, um, very fresh. <laughs> so, I mean, we can see that taking care of our environment is not only just a local or regional affair, as we know with climate change, it's also a global affair. So fantastic that you guys reached out. Um, we will do the same with the other eco clubs all over the world. We need to, just like the ecological systems in nature, we need to connect with each other. Um, we need to share our knowledge and experience and ideas with each other. So I look very much forward to working with you guys again. Thank you very much for reaching out. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Sorry I have to leave so soon. Please continue. Thank you so much, Steve and Crystal. It was very nice to meet you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah. We might be the first uh, two eco-clubs in the world connecting. Uh, I think there is oh. some value in that too. Uh, that you know, was as a we question will connect I had. with others. It's my guess, but uh, we wrote to everyone that we could identify and we got responses from Kenya uh peru uh uh india uh i think that was it uh but we were you were the only ones uh with whom we could actually move forward and schedule a meeting uh, wow 
Yeah. Uh, hopefully so we'll connect honored. with the others too, but it would be great if we could all meet at some point. Uh, yes, and we, to answer your question, some of our challenges, well, there's the politicized ones and the ones that seem to be on the news constantly, which is our forestry our forestry practices, and we've had um, some very extreme protest movements where people have put themselves in harm's way to protect old growth trees and forestry in our area. So uh, if you were to Google old growth Vancouver Island or old growth British Columbia, the news, I mean, it would just shock you actually, the, the um, drama around that. And yet at the heart of that, are those that can't speak for themselves, the tiny creatures and the biodiverse habitats that are, are being affected by our, our human incursion, our human invasion of, their, uh, of the resources. And it doesn't even compare to how the First Nations stewarded the land. And so those conversation, conversations are also a huge part of what Rotary can do in terms of peacemaking, in terms of understanding, building bridges of understanding between our native cultures and our uh, industrial uh, cultures, if you will, that are intent on resource extraction uh, that unfortunately the climate doesn't allow for this to continue the same way as before. We're dependent on the rain and the rain was lacking and is lacking. Each summer is drier and drier. And so it's a real problem. Um, what can we do? Well, we're building awareness of restoring habitats, restoring native plants that can withstand the drought and provide shade and other elements that uh, contribute to a healthier environment for all. So that's huge. In terms of a, a village restoration, also we are creating ways so that we have behavior change just like you, uh, less packaging, less waste. Uh, it's a little bit um, not mainstream yet, but a plant-based diet would be the something to create awareness and education around. And so I've been collecting information from ESREG on the 15 day plant-based diet challenge that uh, was promoted this October. And so there's a bit of pressure on us as the first eco club in our district. And in fact, in Canada to host the resources and project ideas and everything, but I'm up for the challenge. Uh, I've taught myself how to build all of this in WordPress. So I don't have to rely on an outside provider for our web, um, presence. And as secretary, yes, I wear a lot of hats and our club uh, is, is fond of teasing me about the, the things I do as a graphic designer as well. But I believe that one of our gifts that we can offer our community and our Rotary Clubs is communication and how to communicate well. And so I just want to say I was super impressed with your outreach and the uh, welcoming feel of your PDF outreach. And so I created our presentation as a PDF that I can send to you so that you have that as a reference for when you explain to other stakeholders what, what's happening in Canada. Wonderful, thank you. Thank, thank you, Kim. Kim, uh, uh, what uh, is... Uh, sorry. Go, go I was ahead. just going to ask about time. Uh, what, is, uh, what is your consideration for today's meeting? Uh, we oh, usually uh, limit our meetings to one hour. We're yes. happy to stay, but just I, I'm wanted happy to be to respectful. Stay. I'm uh, happy to stay if our club members are okay with time. Um, I have no prior commitments and I've reserved until 9.30 just in case for Q&A. So for us, that is this, this half hour block is completely available. Any other questions? Um, I can, I can um, presume to answer on behalf of our club only because uh, I have been a witness to the club's formation from the beginning and can hopefully remember those details if you ask. So how many members do you have? We have 19, but they are scattered across a uh, geographic region as well as uh, time constraints and availability. And so, in fact, our club has not all met each other yet. <laughs> I am the one they have in common. 
Yeah, we Obviously. were in that same situation uh, for a while. And uh, little by little, uh, there are still uh, members that I haven't met. We're 25 <laughs> people in person. There's still members that I haven't met. Probably Barrett met uh, everyone, I presume. Uh, we yeah, use our YouTube have some channel. Missing. <laughs> we use our YouTube channel as an outreach as well because we post recordings of our meetings and topics, and you can see a variety of members that have attended over the past few weeks. Oh, okay. Okay. For today's meeting, I invited our district uh, executive as well as uh, we have a Facebook page for Rotary District 5020 members. And so I created this meeting as a Facebook event link that they could just click a button and join. And some people showed interest, but as you can see, we didn't have anyone from our district uh, available to join us today, but that I'm so thankful that we were able to record. Great. That's great. I, so, I, I, have, I, have a I have a question that I'm thinking, maybe it's too early, I don't know, but um, do, you, do you have any imagination on maybe how to collaborate uh, between um, eco clubs of the world? I know there's S SRAG or ESRAG, um, um, the action group, and I yes. understand you're, um, maybe some of you, some of the members are part of it. Uh, I, I am an official uh, member. Okay. Yeah, um, and I, I can share just quickly the answer is that I okay. reached out to a United States to the Rotary Club of Minnesota Twin Cities. Okay. And as you know, oh, they were they were featured in the April issue of the Rotary magazine in 2020, mm -hmm. I believe. So or was it this year? Wow, it was really exciting to uh, follow along. So Steve Solbrecht is a is a personal mentor. And he was uh, the membership chair at Ezra for the last little while and insisted that we get plugged in right away to ESRAG. And also I attended several uh, Zoom meetings with the Rotary Club of Twin Cities. So in, in your opinion, uh, we could use ESRAG as a common hub um, between eco clubs also to get together and share ideas. Um, yes. And collaborate yes. on issues. And they are also able to overcome the language uh, differences. They use some practices like uh, transcripts and closed captioning. So if we attended one of your club meetings, for example, we could leverage technology to allow for multiple languages to be featured. Okay. Thank you. So there goes my theory. Uh, so you already met the Twin Cities Club, so we're not the first <laughs> two equal clubs. Uh, actually, you are the first for our club members officially. So uh, okay. I was I was meeting with Steve and attending these meetings on my own as the club advisor right. and club founder. Yes. All right. And um, I really want to introduce our members to the wide world of Rotary. I feel like especially these days uh, when there are lockdowns or um, situations where we can't connect in person, it has enriched my life and is, I can see already the lives of our members to be able to connect with you. May I ask the new Rotarians uh, what attracted, the, what they found in Rotary so far? I realized that it's the eco aspect that attracted all of us. Uh, but we're also going through that learning process ourselves. What have you liked? What have you loved so far? Yeah, we haven't we haven't attended too many or events or collaborations yet, just because of COVID. Um, but the few that we have heard from, the few Rotarians, uh, we've done a few a few volunteer works together. Um, what attracts me is just the international scale of some of the projects that are happening. Uh, because we are so new and trying to get things going ourselves, we haven't had um, a lot of time to, or I haven't had a lot of time to investigate what is available to us through Rotary quite yet. But uh, for me, the initial uh, attraction was just the international scope. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank you all very much for your presentation. And um, I think Kim represents us very well, although a lot of us have not been able to make uh, 
today's meeting, um, you're hearing really so much information from Kim because she is uh, has so much more experience than a lot of us who have just started. Uh, many of us, I can speak for, are involved in other things in our community. And for me, the reason that I was really attracted to it was I love being with like-minded people who have um, ideas and want to gather together to really see those ideas come to fruition. And so being in a group where there's a lot of enthusiasm and a uh, focus for, for the environment, which of course is uh, the up uppermost thing in everybody's mind right now, it, it just feels really exciting. And then to be in a, a part of a bigger picture such as Rotary, which I really didn't have much experience with at all. And, and then to have this experience of, you know, across the world, uh, talking to like-minded people again, that's exactly what I was looking for. And I've actually been in your beautiful city and it, yeah, many, many years ago, but uh, it's very exciting to me to, yeah, to be on the call today. So thank you. Well, I, Thank you. And I have been in your beautiful uh, island, uh, on your island, a few times. In fact, uh, the last time I was there, uh, it was a, a, a really bittersweet uh, day. Uh, it was the election day uh, in 2000. I went to bed uh, in Vancouver Island uh, thinking that Al Gore won. And I woke up. Uh, uh, you know, realizing that he hasn't and that it's going to be a long battle. And uh, so I distinctly remember the hotel, the t TV, <laughs> people. I distinctly remember that. Also, that there should be not too far from you. It, there should be a, a well, how should I say, like a flower, flower garden or like tourists visit a lot. Uh, I've been there. W what is that? What was Butch that? Butchart's Garden. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which that and that itself is an example of how you can take a, a hole in the ground and make it something that is worthy of people traveling, you know, from other countries and enjoying. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful place. And it, it was, it's unimaginable for me to think that that lake is uh, being polluted and that there's overforestation because it's such a pristine part of the world. And uh, of course, Canada has so much, like so many lakes and so many um, forests that probably, probably what half the forests in the world is, is in Canada, I was going to say, probably something like that, isn't it? It's, it's huge. Yeah, uh, beautiful place. Our next club event in person is we're hoping to do a sunrise hike to the top of our local mountain and to be able to uh, connect in person and have that meaningful experience. As stewards, it's one of our also newest park spaces that was acquired by the government and made available to the public, but it is very um, under, under managed right now. So uh, the, the natural rock at the very top was blasted off by a private company that wanted to turn it into some sort of tourist attraction and then ran out of money or opportunity to see their dream through. And so it's got this ugly moonscape at the top and we are hoping to facilitate more um, natural restoration up there or some sort of feature that would be meaningful historically. So in conjunction with the Museum and Historical Society to tell the stories of the region and to also dedicate additional parkland, I believe it's 350 acres adjacent to this land below the mountain that uh, is being used um, for illegal uh, motorized vehicles are ripping up the land, like we're talking um, motorcycles and all-terrain vehicles. And we are hoping to uh, create a, a managed forest below with trails. Uh, one of the showcases I'll put in the chat for our government work is um, an example of what can be done, but we are in a um, under-managed Southern region 
And because we're not incorporated, we have this village mindset that we simply can't um, qualify for the funding and management that we really deserve. Mm -hmm. But I'll type in the name of the place that is a showcase in our district. And then you can um, Google it or I can send links by yeah. email. Yes, yeah, so our um, sunrise hike is happening this month. Uh, I believe it's next weekend and may, uh, because of weather also, we might look at the weekend at the 30th. So we can look forward to some amazing pictures on your Facebook page. And yeah, and do you have Instagram also? How do you feel yeah. about social media? That was another question I, I wanted to ask. Uh, we have, we have uh, a, a good team, uh, a, a marketing communications team, uh, a, a, a professionals like yourself, Kim, uh, who are uh, looking at it. And we do have social media now, meaning uh, is the, all those accounts, the Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, and Instagram, and uh, LinkedIn. And, uh, but our thinking is that it's hard to, to reach uh, a lot of people when, when you're so new. And we're hoping to leverage uh, partnerships, just like in any other thing we do, uh, we want to leverage partnerships because like municipalities, for instance, have huge, uh, you know, uh, clicks that, that come to their uh, sites and we could probably benefit from like, they, we could probably leverage them. There's also one here who wanted to start tweeting uh, Marve right there. Say hi, Marve. She wanted to start tweeting. She, she's one of the younger ones, uh, a new generation. And, uh, and you know, I have a marketing background and marketing communications used to be under me. And I always ask these hard questions like, who's the target audience? What's the message? What do you want to get out of it? What's the tagline? What, you know, what's the call? And Marve says, I don't care. I just want to tweet. <laughs> right. I was too uh, social media. <laughs> yeah, she's really into social media. And she's managing a municipality. She used to, right? Uh, yeah, I was. The, the, I was the yeah. mayor's yeah, advisor. So it was like, oh, it's my job. I should do this. Yeah. Yeah, she hated me for stopping her. No, I didn't <laughs> hate you. <laughs> we will definitely look you up on Instagram to follow. Yeah, and I'm still helping to create the Instagram things. <laughs> I'm still there. <laughs> I like I like the social media because we can amplify the messages of the other uh, groups, especially the other environmental groups. And so we have that camaraderie, that feeling of togetherness when we're all saying the same things or showing our support. All right, I've officially, I've officially followed you on Instagram through our uh, club account. <laughs> That's fantastic. Great. Yeah, you will see our, uh, there's a, a short presentation about food awareness there ah. that went out today. Oh, fantastic. You guys are on it. Wow. So, As we say. No good deed goes unpunished. We've sent you our other accounts to follow, yeah. please. <laughs> I'll save the chat. Yeah, I'll yeah, save well, the chat. Well, once I heard that you followed, okay, there, the goes, <laughs> there it goes, all the list. <laughs> Fantastic. We have, um, I think we value storytellers in our culture and particularly in our area, geographically of Canada. We're very proud of being hosts and uh, showcasing the, the stories here. And I, I think it's a great approach to an eco club because 
stories are, they contain the emotions that we can connect to and internalize so that we can have buy-in. It captures our imagination when we can uh, create a opportunity and phrase it as a story, don't you find? So maybe even yes. your, your cease not problem your cease not problem could be captured somehow in a story or a children's viewpoint or something that um, could also create the uh, motivation that you're looking for, for quick action. It is for our future, it is for our youth. I echo actually, your thoughts. Yes, um, that's true. right. And it, it's a great idea, actually. Um, I, yeah. haven't, I haven't thought of it. I'm taking a note of that um, a children, um, a child story, let's say, uh, that could create um, a large awareness um, and a good foundation uh, for next generations. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's there's this booklet that who did it? Who died, Darni, or something? Uh, there's a a pretty well known uh, NGO here uh, that uh, has a a booklet um, that is aimed at children, uh, but it's so didactic. It's so like, uh, there's no story in it. Just like at the moment you said that, it just sparked an idea in, in my mind as well, because it is like, it's the reduced version of what you would uh, say to an adult. Um, to simpler words, but still there's really no focus, no story. It's like um, um, a story would do much better, obviously, you're right. Yeah. That could be a project. Uh, yeah. Because it, that, it, could be, yeah. it would also be universal. The story is relevant for every country. Uh, it could be adapted culturally maybe, but if you were to do something as your club, I think, you know, there would be use for it in other countries and it could be promoted through the Rotary Network. Oh, very good. And also I'm thinking of art and murals and other ways of storytelling that don't involve words. Um, you are perfect. I love the ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and I'm just taking my notes. <laughs> yeah, also me too. I have so many notes. <laughs> I love it. So it looks like we'll maybe have another session sometime in the near future to see you know, how we're doing to explore maybe collaboration opportunities now that we got to know each other a little bit. Yes, follow up and also more stories. Yeah. Sounds good. Very yeah. nice to meet you all today and, and hear what you're working on. Same here. Same I, here. I'm, same here. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted. You. I'm delighted that we could do this actually. Um, yeah. Yes. Have a great, have a great weekend. So we'll and, see you next time. And if we have permission, we would like to wrap up the recording by mentioning that we will be able to reference this recording. Both of our clubs will be have full access to it and be able to share with members and, and anyone else who would be interested. So if I have uh, your permission, that would just be wonderful because even our discussion today, there's so much there. We may have missed some detail. And uh, so I invite you to check out the recording later and we would like to be a resource for all Rotary and all Eco Clubs. So thank you. Um, our YouTube Absolutely. channel is Seanigan Rotary and you can also find it on our webpage, seanigan rotaryecoclub.ca. So I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>